Welcome to B&H Videos. Well, hi, everybody. I want to thank you folks for joining us today. My name is Rudy Winston. Uh, I work as a technical advisor with Canon in the uh, camera division with our customer informa consumer information uh, department. And uh, it's my pleasure to really be able to come out and work with folks like yourselves and be able to you know, talk to you not just about our products, but about photography, about getting good pictures, getting better results with the equipment you own. Uh, you know, we're going to try real hard not to sell to you today. You've pretty much been sold to already. But what we want to do is talk about just how you can take the gear you have and get better pictures with it by understanding the tools that are in your camera, what they can do, and how you can apply them in different situations. Now, one of the things that you can do, obviously, uh, one of the, the most important things in getting better pictures is just simply having good photographic understanding and technique. Today isn't the day to go over photographic basics like what's an ISO and shutter speeds and apertures, but obviously that's the foundation on which all of this is built. So for anybody that's still a little unclear about some of that stuff, we may refer to it from time to time, but if it's still a little unclear, B&H does offer some excellent basic photography seminars from time to time, and if that's something that you're not up to snuff on, I would definitely urge you to consider attending one of those because it can really make a difference when you understand what the numbers are really meaning and what they're really doing for you. But again, our topic today is how to take your Rebel camera and get better images with it, regardless of the kind of pictures you take, whether you like to shoot nature, whether you like to shoot portraits of people, whether you like to shoot sports, close-up pictures, whatever it might be. There are a lot of different things you can do to get better results. Now, over the years, since 2003, when the first Rebel was introduced, there have been a number of different Canon EOS Rebel models. And while there's been some changes on them and they keep improving in different areas like high ISO performance and shooting speed and that kind of thing, there are a lot more similarities than there are differences. And so it's, I mentioned to one of the gentlemen earlier today, it's going to be impossible to go over every nuance of every single model. But what we are going to talk about today, in general, I think is applicable, about 90% of it is going to be applicable to every camera in the lineup. And where there are major deviations, we'll certainly mention that. Before we go any further, just a quick show of hands. Is anybody here shooting with the original 6 million pixel digital Rebel? Okay. Anybody with a Rebel XT? Okay. A few of you. Uh, XTI? Okay. A few more. Uh, XS? Okay. Got a couple. XSI? Right. Uh, and T1i. Okay, got a couple there. So, so it's spread out pretty evenly among you. Um, and this is good. I'm, the camera's, like I say, been a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous camera for our customers and for Canon. It's one of the best selling cameras in the world. And like I say, every time a new version comes out, they keep making it a little bit better. But my last, the last thing I'm here to do is to try to twist your arm to go and buy the latest and greatest. You can get great pictures with the camera you have. Again, the camera layout is pretty similar when you go from one to the next. So when we talk about controls and stuff, most of them are effectively pretty similar. Those of you that may want to follow along with your camera, you're welcome to. Don't freak out if what you see on the screen looks a little different from the way things are in your camera. You know, in just the same way as I'm sure most of you in here have had the opportunity at one point or another to travel and rent a car at an airport and you get in a new car in a car that is not the same brand and model as your car. And yeah, you got to look around a little bit to find out where the air conditioner switch is, where's the switches to adjust the mirrors, where's the radio on and off, where are the lights and that kind of thing. But, you know, just because they're not in exactly the same place in your car doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to work them. You just got to sort of work around a little bit and figure out where they are. So not something to worry about. Again, any of these cameras you can take great pictures with. Uh, in fact, this next set of pictures coming up, we're all taken with a Rebel XTI. Uh, there's no question these cameras can produce sharp images with great color, great detail, uh, and it can match the performance of cameras costing hundreds or even thousands of dollars more. For those of you who do want to follow along, and even if you're not following along, most of the stuff we're talking about here today involves getting in under the hood of the camera. 
and using some of the controls, some of the menu settings that are in there that you can use. It's amazing when you look at today's cameras, what is in the camera compared to the way things were if you go back a number of years when we were shooting with film cameras and the controls really were pretty primitive even if they had automatic exposure. An important thing with the Rebels is if you put the camera on green zone or one of the picture icon modes, you've got the training wheels on. There's nothing to say that you, you can't do that. It's automatic, it works well, it's extremely convenient. But when you do that, the camera locks you out of many of its capabilities. The menus are simplified and a lot of the controls and your custom functions are simply not available. So, what I'm gonna recommend you do is take the training wheels off and at the very least, put the camera in the P mode, the so-called program mode. It's still totally automatic, but now you can get to everything. First thing I wanna talk about is one of the most fundamental in getting good pictures, and that's controlling your exposure. The Rebel cameras have an excellent metering system, and under normal circumstances, you can just basically turn the camera on and point and shoot, and usually get results that are in the ballpark. But I think part of the reason you folks are here is you wanna get a little bit past the snapshot stage and get pictures that go that extra step above. And again, controlling your exposure is one of the first steps. Obviously, if you don't have exposure, you don't have a picture. You gotta get the exposure at least in the ballpark and we're gonna talk about some of the tools in the camera that are gonna let you do that. It doesn't matter really what kind of lighting you're shooting in, whether you're shooting in a dimly lit condition or a brightly lit condition. Exposure, there isn't a right answer for exposure, but what exposure is all about is getting results that please you for the scene you're shooting, the subject matter you're shooting, and the conditions you're shooting it in. Your first line of defense is what's on the back of the camera. You take a picture with a digital camera, you can see the results right on the LCD monitor. And that is your first step in getting good results, is look at what's on the monitor. Now the monitor on these cameras, or on any digital camera, is not you know, a, a, a calibrated 30 inch Apple cinema display. It's not gonna be absolutely 100% dead on accurate in every single regard, color and contrast and all that. But the monitors today are better than ever, and it does give you a pretty good idea of what you got. So if you get an image that just doesn't look right, too light, too dark, whatever, there's a real good chance that's, what, that's what's going on. It's too light or too dark. And it's telling you right there that, you know, without any other technical knowledge needed, hey, under, under ideal circumstances, you want to take this picture over again and adjust it. Yes. Well, gentleman's question was, the, can you adjust the brightness of that LCD monitor? And the answer is yes. Uh, all the cameras give you somewhere in the menu settings, in the setup menu usually, a setting for LCD brightness. And the catch is normally you want to have it fairly high so that you can see it decently in bright light if you're outside in sunlight or whatever. But sometimes that can throw you off a little bit. And as you get used to the camera, the more you shoot with it, the more acclimated you get and you begin to understand, okay, if I see this on the monitor, here's what I'm going to get on my computer. And you begin to sort of innately know that. Um, but anyway, the bottom line is, you know, if you see an exposure that just simply isn't right, you've got a tool at your disposal to change it, and that's your exposure compensation. To get to the exposure compensation, and again, you can't do this on the green zone. You've got to take the training wheels off. You've got to at least be in the program mode, which is, again, it's totally automatic, just like the green zone is, but now you can set everything. You press the button on the back of the camera with a plus-minus icon, and while you're pressing it, Turn the top main dial. And what you'll see when you do that in your viewfinder is a scale, a little analog scale. And you'll see it, 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 there's a plus two and a minus two and then tick marks and numbers in between. Basically, if you go on the plus side, you're adding light. You're going to get a lighter result than the camera would normally give you. So if you took a picture that was too dark, that's the way you'd want to go. You want to lighten it. And conversely, of course, you go on the minus side, you're taking away light. You'd be setting it to give you a darker result. And each time, each click you turn the dial, the little tick mark moves over, uh, you know, one, the little tick mark moves over one indicator at a time for each click. Plus one means plus one stop. And in photographic terms, one stop means you have doubled the amount of light coming in, or in the case of minus one, you've cut it in half. 
plus or minus two means you've doubled it again four times as much as you had originally or minus two you got one quarter as much as you had originally and then you got the fractional stops as well basically you're gonna come across two reasons that you want to adjust exposure one is basically to just simply get it correct take a picture it looks too dark bingo you can use compensation in this case plus 1.3 stops was used to get the white flowers to really look like white flowers not like kind of a muddy gray the other reason that you may want to go to your exposure compensation sometimes is subjective and that's to get just a different look in the picture this is pretty close to what our eyes saw minus two stops gives us a different result sometimes that can be kind of neat and again this is you know taking your photography beyond the snapshot stage and trying to say something about the subjects that you're shooting here are, there's a number of things to be aware of in terms of just the way your camera meters and handles exposure any camera with built-in light metering basically after all is said and done is going to look out at whatever you're photographing and it assumes that there's going to be light things and dark things and you know things that are in the middle and it's going to kind of try to mix it up in layman's terms figuratively and give you what it thinks is a good result if you present it with something that is predominantly light colored it's going to try to make it gray so certainly light colored subjects when you fill the frame with something light whether it's a snow scene whether it's a tight shot of that bride in a white wedding dress or whatever the camera left to its own devices is probably going to tend to underexpose it a little bit at least sometimes so just go to your exposure compensation and lighten it in this case it required the full plus two stops to get the snow to look white with detail not blown out white anytime you got a lot of sky in the picture that's another situation where the camera's gonna see even though it's a, this is an overcast day but still you got that brightness above we're pointing the camera at the light at the uh, signpost here but it's seeing all that brightness and it says well we got to kind of neutralize this cut that down and in, in doing so it gives you a little bit dark result well once again go to your exposure compensation dial it up a little bit there is no one right answer in terms of how far to go you just you got to kind of do it by feel and eventually you'll start to get a sense of how much to go in different situations anybody that says that there's one right amount either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you because there isn't one right amount one scene may take you know a whole lot another scene may take just a little bit to get the results that you're looking for backlit situations where you got a subject that doesn't have a lot of light directly falling on them but you got a bright window here you got light from the window falling on this wall here it's a white wall the camera once again sees all that brightness and it tends to try to knock it down a little bit now once again just go to your exposure compensation bring it up you get a lot more detail yes it changed it depends on what exposure mode you're in the gentleman's question was is exposure is exposure compensation changing the aperture the answer is it depends on what exposure mode you're in if you're in the program mode where the camera automatically sets the shutter speed and the aperture it's going to change both if you're in shutter priority mode where the camera you set the shutter speed and the camera adjusts the aperture it's going to adjust the aperture and likewise in aperture priority you set the aperture camera sets the shutter speed and varies it automatically when you go to your compensation it's going to continue to vary the shutter speed full manual mode there is no exposure compensation then you just adjust the shutter speed and the aperture on your own you run into the same thing when you shoot subjects that have a lot of dark stuff in them you know you look at this picture about the only light things in this picture are the lady's face maybe this yellow jacket here other than that everything in this picture is fairly dark if not black at least fairly dark in tone once again you know you can take the picture with zero compensation set but don't be surprised if it looks a little bit too light and her face starts to look a little bit washed out you may have to use some minus compensation to get the camera to darken everything sufficiently doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your camera it's doing what it was supposed to uh, you just presented it with a scene that's a little unusual than what the end compared to what the engineers uh, designed it for You got a handful of other tools to control exposure in the rebel camera one of them is the automatic exposure bracketing auto bracketing basically lets you take three pictures in a row and it varies the exposure on each one abbreviated AEB for auto exposure bracketing and this is an example same shot but with the bracketing set the camera takes three pictures and each one is going to be different and ideally the camera starts off with one it thinks is normal and then it deliberately lightens one and darkens one 
You go into the menu and you tell it, number one, you want to do this, and then you tell it by how much you want it to lighten and darken. You can lighten and darken by just a third of a stop. You can lighten and darken by up to the full two stops uh, if you want to. One of the, the way auto bracketing is always explained when you read the books on, the basic books on photography and all that is, well, if you're in a tricky lighting situation and you're not really sure what the right exposure is, if you got the time to set auto bracketing, you'll have three shots and one of them should be right. And there's an element of truth to that. But another cool thing about auto bracketing is it can give you three different looks, three different sets of, if you will, feeling about your picture in situations like if you're shooting sunsets or whatever, when you, especially if you only vary it by a third or two thirds of a stop. You got enough of a difference between each picture that you can see the difference, but it just gives you a little something else to work with. You may like one that's a little bit lighter. You may like one that's a little bit darker. So auto bracketing is kind of a neat tool to know and understand. Is it something you're always gonna use? No, it's, you know, it's there for those times when you think you're gonna need it, otherwise my recommendation would be just turn it off. And do, do remember, with the auto bracketing, if you set it, it is not self-canceling. So once you set auto bracketing and you tell it, okay, I want you to take three shots, each one to stop apart, fine, you go ahead and take your three shots. The next time you go to pick the camera up and take a picture, it's gonna, again, try to bracket the next three shots you take. So if you are done with the bracketing, go back into the menu and dial it back down to zero and then hit the set button again to lock that in to turn it, to turn it off uh, because it doesn't cancel itself automatically. Yes? One sec. Yes. Yeah, you just go back in and reset it to zero. Gentleman's question was, if you, is there any way to set it so that, it'll, that it won't clear itself even if you turn the camera off? And the answer is no. The higher end cameras like the 1D series have a feature where you can do that, but the Rebel camera does not. So auto bracketing is kind of an interesting tool to play with and to understand that it's there for those situations where you may want to call it up. Another very useful one from time to time is the ability to change what the camera is metering, what the metering system is looking at. You've got, in most of the Rebel cameras, you've got four different metering patterns. Some of the Rebels don't have spot metering. So if your camera doesn't have the true spot metering, don't worry. Understand that normally, when you go to take a picture with the camera using the evaluative metering, the camera's reading pretty much the whole picture area. And it breaks it into different zones. You don't see this in the viewfinder, but it breaks it into different zones. And it compares the brightness of where you're focusing to other areas of the scene. And if it thinks that it's lighter, it should be lightened or darkened. It tries to perform its magic. Usually, that works great. But there are going to be times where you may want to have it meter less than the full picture. Partial metering, value of metering is indicated by a symbol that looks like this, incidentally. Partial metering is your first tool there. With partial metering, just like the name suggests, the camera's metering a smaller area. And if your Rebel has spot metering, now not all of them do, uh, but many of them have the spot metering, then you're reading an even smaller area. This is what we're talking about. With the partial metering, you're reading about 10% of the picture in the center of the picture area. And if your camera has spot metering and you set it to spot metering, it's reading about 3% of the picture, again, in the center area. Yes. What you're seeing here in the presentation? Yeah. Close enough for government work, as the saying goes. Okay, so you don't think of degrees. Degrees are going to mess you up because degrees would change with any lens you use. What you do, you deal with it in how much of a percentage of the picture area is it taken up. Like exactly. It's a fat spot. It's great for portraits and that kind of stuff. We'll show you a few examples of where each one could be useful. Now, anytime you use the partial of the spot metering, if you're using automatic exposure, again, program, shutter priority, aperture priority, there's another great tool that goes hand in glove with these, and that's your AE lock, your auto exposure lock, which is indicated on your camera by a little icon that looks like an asterisk, a little star icon as it were. Here's how AE lock works. If we've set the camera to partial or spot metering, we know we're reading just the central area of the picture. We may not want to take the finished picture with the statue right in the dead center. 
you know, good composition usually calls for moving things away from being bullseye. But when we go to take a spot or a partial meter reading, we have to do it in the center with the Rebel cameras. We can't do it off center. So, take your spot or your partial reading if that's what you wanted to do. Whoops. Sorry. And then, once you've done that, just press the AE lock button on the back of your camera, which again is that little button with the asterisk icon. That little asterisk right there, you just press it with your thumb. And you'll see that same icon appear below your view, in the strip of information below your, picture, below your viewfinder. Then, the reading is locked. It's not gonna change now if you move the camera. So now you can move the camera off center, recompose, shoot the picture, and the reading stays locked as long as the meter stays on. Yes? If you press it once, it'll stay on for as long as the meter stays on. If you want it to stay on for a prolonged period of time, if I wanted to really explore this statue and shoot a dozen different pictures of it, then you probably ought to just keep your thumb on that back button. And that'll keep it locked and the meter won't go off after you take the first picture. Yeah, this one will clear itself as soon as the, as soon as the meter goes off. By meter going off, I mean you take a picture or you, don't, you, do, you wake the camera up and then don't do anything. After a while, the information in the viewfinder goes out, that's it. The meter's off, and if you had taken an AE lock reading, at that point, it gets cleared out of memory. Again, not as long as you do it relatively quick. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. That'll work. Young lady's question was, can you do it? Can you take a spot meter reading and hold the shutter button halfway down? And the answer is absolutely. That'll do it. And you could, if you were good at keeping your finger on the button, you could take more than one picture. You know, take one, don't take your finger off, take, lift it up halfway, take another picture, lift it off halfway. You could do that too. Right. Because the AE lock locks it in the first place. If you keep, if you push your finger halfway down on the button, it doesn't lock. If all I did, I want to make sure that's, that's, that we're clear on this. If all you did was put the camera in spot meter, Meter the statue in the center of the picture, push the shutter button halfway down, and then recompose. Guess what? Your meter reading isn't locked. Your meter reading's now looking at whatever the, is in the center of your picture, you know, here. It's looking at the sky or whatever. No good. If you really want to lock it on the statue, you need to, you know, focus on it and then push the AE lock button. Now, with that meter, mem meter reading memorized, you can keep it memorized by just keeping your finger halfway down on the button for a prolonged period of time if you were waiting for somebody to get in position under the statue or whatever. Uh, that, that would be the purpose of that. So I hope I made that clear. As long as you hit the button in the back first, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, again, the asterisk button is the AE lock button. Press that, whatever it sees, locks in place. Now if you move the camera, it doesn't change. As long as you see that little asterisk in the viewfinder, it's telling you, hey, the metering got locked on something. And if you don't like what it was, just press the button, you know, point it at something else, press the button again. Yes? Does the have spot no, it's got just partial. So it's got like a fat spot. So you can still, you, you know, use the technique. It's great for metering off bases and that kind of thing. These are some examples of what the spot and partial metering can be real good for. And again, using the AE lock makes it very easy to you know, freely compose and everything once you've taken a meter reading. You know, it's great for things like silhouettes. Great for things, here's a, a situation where you got just a little shaft of sunlight late in the day coming and hitting one statue. Just take a spot meter reading off that statue, lock it in, recompose, you know, just kind of fine tune the composition where you want, take the picture. Works great for that kind of thing. When you want to read just a small part of a scene, it's great. Spot metering, you don't think of it for this, but it can be great for sunsets. Okay, now, for Lordy's sake, don't go and point the meter right at the sun and don't spend time looking at the sun. <laughs> Obviously, that can hurt you. But if you take a spot meter reading or a partial meter reading off the sky away from the sun, a little bit away from the sun, and lock that in, you will get a very good and somewhat natural looking result. That can work very effectively, and in doing so, your camera is not being thrown off by this big white by this big white ball here. So that can be a very useful technique as well. And obviously, in situations where you've got a subject against a bright background, you can take a spot or a partial meter reading 
and know that you're reading right off the face and it is not going to be confused by the bright background or anything like that. And no one's saying make your photography difficult. There's a lot of features in the camera and it's important to understand what they can do for you. No one's saying that you got to use them all the time. Okay, so don't just don't feel like because we're talking about the partial metering and the spot metering that this is something you should be using 90 percent of the time. In fact, you know, for most people, I'd say 90 plus percent of the time, you probably shouldn't bother using it because it isn't necessary most of the time. But sometimes when you want to slow down and be careful, it can really be a great tool. Doesn't matter what digital camera you're using. One thing you can't do with digital is overexpose bright highlights. Bright areas, light colored areas, if you let them one way or another, here's an example of a macro shot of a flower. It's a white flower, obviously. We want a white subject to look white in our finished picture and to have some detail and texture and so on, whether it's this flower, whether it's a bride's wedding dress, whatever. But regardless, what you can't do with digital is let this happen. If you overexpose important highlight areas in digital, the party's over. That shot is a goner, and there is uh, almost nothing you can do in Photoshop most of the time to get that information back. So one way or another, the most important thing is to ascertain when you shoot a picture, is there something light here that is important where I need detail, and is that light thing overexposed or not? If it is, you better take the picture again, and one way or another, darken it a little bit. Talk, switch gears a little and talk a little about your autofocusing. Autofocusing sounds like one of those things that should be something you can pretty much take for granted. These cameras today have autofocus systems that are very refined. You know, they should work, you know, most of the time and, you know, give us good results. So it should be kind of almost like the automatic transmission on your car. Other than putting it in drive, why should you have to think about it? Well, autofocus, to really master your camera, autofocusing is an acquired skill. It's not something to when you're really good that you want to just take for granted. And the, the Rebel cameras, again, give you a number of different ways that you can control what the camera is going to focus on and what it's going to do. Anytime you're using autofocus with a camera, with a digital SLR, there are two things you've got to ask yourself. Number one, is your subject moving or is it standing still? By moving, it doesn't have to be an athlete, you know, sprinting at the camera. It can be, you know, even subtle movement. You know, if you were, had a speaker at a podium and they were kind of just, you know, moving back and forth, that's movement. You have to account for that. And where in the scene do you want the camera to focus? You know, the scene has multiple people. Is there a particular one you want it to focus on? Think about these two things. Looking at the first subject, the first uh, uh, question, rather, whether the subject is moving or still dictates what autofocus mode you're going to use the camera in. Now, once again, you can't be in the green zone here. You got to work the camera in one of the so-called creative zone modes. Program, TV means shutter priority. It doesn't mean television. AV means aperture value or aperture priority, and M means manual exposure. Nobody's saying you got to use manual exposure for any of this, but just understand you can't be in the green zone. To set an AF mode on the camera, you got a button on the camera that'll say AF. It may not be in the exact same position that this one is, but somewhere on the back of the camera there'll be an AF button. Press the button, and then just go to your main dial. Turn the top main dial up by the camera. And with the Rebel cameras, you're going to have three choices. Those choices are one shot, AI focus, and AI servo. Let's take a look at all three of them. One shot AF mode is a bit of a misnomer. It makes it sound like you can only take one picture, and that's not what it is at all. One shot doesn't care if you take a whole sequence of pictures at three frames a second. What one shot does care about is it's assuming you have a stationary, non-moving subject. And what it's going to do is let you focus on the subject, lock that focus on the subject, and it's going to keep it locked as long as you maintain partial pressure on the shutter button. So anytime you've got subjects that aren't moving. One shot is where you want to have the camera. You've told the camera, hey, expect a non-moving subject, lock the focus on it, and we're good to go. AI servo is different. AI, incidentally, stands for, uh, automa for um, in auto and automatic intelligence, uh, in case you ever get that question I asked of you. But AI servo expects to see a moving subject. 
and it expects to track that movement. It can be movement coming right at the camera, could be movement moving away from the camera. But one way or another, AI servo is where you want to put it if you know you've got a subject that's going to be moving. Now you have a third setting, AI focus. AI focus is a little of both. Basically, the camera is going to automatically pick one shot or servo for you. The camera is going to look at your subject or your scene. It's going to ask itself, does it see recognizable movement? And if it doesn't, it'll, self, it'll just set itself to one shot. And if it does see movement, it'll set itself to servo. Anytime you were using the camera in the green zone, in the fully automatic green zone, the camera always works this way for convenience. And that's what AI focus is all about. It's convenient. But there's a catch. And the catch is every time you push the shutter button halfway down, the camera has to ask itself, okay, is it moving or is it stationary? Now, if all you're shooting is something like a speaker at a podium, it's probably not going to mess you up too much. But if you're shooting subjects that are moving with some aggressiveness to their movement, every time you do that, the camera's going to have to take a perceptible half second or so to ask itself what to do before it does anything. Not a good idea if you're on a sideline shooting pictures at your kid brother's high school football game or something. So if you're shooting subjects that you know are moving, just you know, save yourself, the, save yourself the anxiety and just put the camera in servo. Life will be a lot simpler. Second question I asked is where do you want the camera to focus? And this is wh where we get into managing your focusing points. Focusing points are the little boxes you see in the viewfinder. Many of the Rebels have seven focusing points, some of them have nine focusing points, but the concept of working with them is the same, even if the arrangement of them in the viewfinder is a little bit different depending on the model you're using. The whole idea of having multiple points, in other words, not just one in the middle, but points to the outside, is to allow you to focus and compose in one movement, in one step, whether your subject is centered, or whether your subject is off-centered. You know, you'll, you'll hear people talk about great composition in pictures and how important it is, and I'm not here to deny any of that because it's certainly one of the bedrocks of great photography. And usually with great composition, you're dealing with subjects that are not right in a dead center. With multiple focusing points, you've got the ability to take a subject, put it off-center, and focus on it and shoot it in one movement, in one step. Yes? Now we'll talk about that. There's a couple of ways you can go about this. One is to let the camera pick the point for you. And that's called automatic AF point selection. If you've set the camera to one shot, and again, remember one shot AF means you've told the camera, hey, there's a non-moving subject, we're going to just lock focus on it. If you combine that with automatic point selection, with all the points being active, what the camera's going to do is it's going to focus on the nearest thing it sees with decent detail. So on a shot like this one at a memorial, the camera has nine focusing points, and each of the points is giving information back to the camera. Each of the points is active. The camera is going to focus on the nearest thing it sees with detail, which, of course, in this case, is these flowers in the foreground. And the points will light up, the point or point, plural, will light up red to tell you, hey, here's where we focused. Here's the decision we made. And it's up to you to think about it for a second and say, okay, is that what I wanted? And if it isn't, I mean, if for whatever reason you wanted this eternal flame sharp or the fixture that the flame is mounted on, you need to do something a little different. But again, the camera, when you're in one-shot autofocus with automatic point selection, camera's going to focus on the nearest thing it sees, and it reports to you what it's focusing on. Yes. Not in auto. The question was, can you tailor what it's doing so that it doesn't focus on, so that you define what's the nearest thing? Automatic point selection, the answer is no. You got another tool to do that that we'll talk about in a moment. If you happen to be shooting in servo with automatic point selection, the way the camera behaves is a little different. Remember, again, servo autofocus 
is intending to track moving subjects. If you're an AI servo, all the points are active, but now the camera expects that it's going to start shooting something in the center. And then if that subject kind of zigs and zags off center, like one of the Olympic skiers you folks saw last week or whatever, the idea is that it'll pass it off to one of those outer points if the subject moves off center and allow you to continue to focus on that subject. There's an example of that, starting out with the center. All the points are active. We're in servo. we got a moving subject. And as the subject moves off center, what the camera's going to try to do is pass it off to the outer points and you know, let them continue to track the subject as it continues to move toward the camera. Now, understand, that, that can be a great convenience, but... There's a couple of reality checks here when we're talking about automatic point selection with a moving subject in servo. One of them is the camera has to use a lot more processing power to figure out where is the subject moving, not just how fast is it moving. With a case like that girl coming down the, the driveway on a bicycle at a fairly sedate speed, not too much of a problem. Uh, don't expect that on a sideline at Giant Stadium shooting a Jets game that with a running back running full speed at you, it's going to be able to make the focus on that subject with the same alacrity. Challenging subjects like birds in flight, that kind of thing, uh, it's going to be hard pressed to keep up with hard, with fast moving subjects like that if they're moving off center. Um, the other thing is just that again, in terms of how fast can it track, you're you're not going to get the best best results there. It's there for convenience, and sometimes it can work pretty well. And finally. If you've got multiple subjects in the scene, if you were shooting like a soccer game with like a number of players in the scene, it's going to get messed up real fast because even if you've got, you know, your kid brother running at the camera and you start tracking him, you know, coming in the, at the center point, if there are other subjects around outside from where that first player is, it's going to start getting messed up. It's fine when you've got one subject, like that bicyclist or a skier coming down a slope or something, but when you've got multiple subjects, it can it can get sort of messed up quickly. Yes? Oh, yeah, if you're asking, the, the question was, I, I think uh, this is the question. Yeah, about three shots per second or whatever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's the gentleman's question was, can you combine continuous shooting speed at roughly three, three and a half frames a second with servo autofocus and continue to track a moving subject? The answer is definitely. And all I'm saying is just understand that if you do that with automatic point selection where all the points are active, sometimes if the movement is aggressive, the camera is going to get messed up. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm, you... Uh, yeah, and again, if, if you understand what I'm saying, if you're in servo, the camera's going to start its read at the center if you've got all the points selected. That's a situation where you may want to do the next thing we're going to talk about. So sit on that for a second. I'm sorry? Sometimes. It's uh, the... That's going to just that's going to depend on a whole lot of other things. But let's assume that you just want to get one thing sharp. That's the that's the purpose of this discussion here. The automatic point selection is a nice tool. Let's face it; it's convenient. It allows you to shoot quick, and in some cases, it can work with great alacrity. But it's not going to be perfect. There are going to be times where you don't want to focus on the nearest thing. You know, a shot like this one. I don't want to focus on the lady's back. Obviously, I'm looking to focus on the people that are facing the camera, and they're not the nearest thing. What do you do? It's simple. You tell the camera what you want it to do. You be the boss. And one way of doing that is manual focus point selection. And what that means is you're picking one focusing point. You're telling the system, hey, I want you to focus here. You know, for example, you, know, you, can, you can pick any point in a scene and just tell it, hey, this is where I want you to focus. I don't care if it's the nearest thing or not. Here is my main subject. Here's where I want you to focus. Where you focus can change the whole look of your picture. 
Understand that when anybody, even a casual viewer, looks at a picture, there are basically three things that are going to attract their eye in the, in the scene. Things that are light colored, things that are bright colored, and things that are sharp. And where you place the sharpness tells the viewer what you want them to focus on. It's telling them what you were trying to say with this picture. With manual point selection, you can tell the viewer, hey, I want to say something about this, or I want to say something about this. Two different pictures. Even when you take a, a shot like a tight head shot, usually there is one thing that you want to focus on and have be sharper than anything else in the scene. Normally in a portrait, that's the eyes. And typically that's the eye closest to the camera. Although in this case, that's an exception because the eye closest to the camera is obviously is obscured in shadow. But you know, whether you're shooting a picture of you know, your cat or your dog, a person, whatever. If you're shooting a, a picture of a living thing, unless you've got a distinct reason not to, you usually want to put the focus right on the eyes or the eye nearest to the camera. And again, manual point selection gives you the tool to do that. Here's how you do it. On the back of the camera, you're going to press the AF point selection button. And that's a button that's marked with a little icon that looks like this, representing your different focusing points. Press that button, and then use either the cross keys, which are the four north, south, east, west buttons on the back of the camera, or turn the top main dial. Either one is fine. I like using the dial because it just, it's a little quicker, but you can use either one. And the idea is, while you're looking through the viewfinder, with each button press or each click of the dial, you'll see the points move around. When you get to where you want, just stop, tap the shutter button lightly, and you're ready to go. When you're going through this process, if all the points light up, you're in automatic point selection. So that's what you'd want to do if you wanted to get back to automatic point selection mode, is press that point selector button and use either the back buttons or the top dial and just turn them until all the points light up. When they do, stop, you're back in automatic point selection. Another real important aspect of controlling autofocus, about being the master of your autofocus, is understanding what the focus points are seeing. The little box you're seeing has to see some detail at your subject. So in a shot like this one, which is a shadowed palm frond against a setting sky, a, a setting sun, the sun isn't in the picture, but obviously it's a, it's a late afternoon shot. If we were to use the center focusing point, it's not seeing any detail at all. And you can sit there until the sun goes down, and you're not going to get the camera to focus on that. What you need to do is move the system so that the point or points are seeing something with detail. Then the camera will zip right in and normally focus without a problem. Yes? Sure, if you're in, excuse me. If you're in one shot, absolutely. If you're in one shot, what will happen is if the camera can't find focus, number one, it won't let you take the picture. And number two, there's a focus confirmation light that appears, a little round green light in your viewfinder. And that light will blink on and off real fast like a car's turn indicator. And it's just saying, hey, I can't see anything to focus on. Uh, but you, know, you can press the button all you want, and it won't let you take the picture. Now, if you were in servo, it will let you take the picture. But there's no guarantee it's going to be in focus. Again, a continuous autofocus, tracking a moving subject. So understand that controlling what your camera is doing when you're talking about your autofocus, being willing to pick a focusing point when you want to focus. You know, if I'm taking, if I want to, if if somebody sitting in the third row in this audio, in this audience is my best friend, and I want to take a picture of them, they're the person I want in focus. Maybe not the people in the front row. Just you know, pick a pick a focusing point manually and put it right on that person. Tell the system what you want it to focus on. Make an intelligent decision about whether you want to be in one shot or servo. And it's amazing when you do how often the camera will back you up and give you images that are that next step beyond where you've been before. There's a lot of cool things you can do with the Rebel cameras to customize them, to make them kind of, to change some of the functions and make them do what you want to do quickly. Now, I have, for those of you who, weren't, who, weren't all, who came in late, we have custom function sheets up here for the different Rebel models. So if you, if you haven't already grabbed one, if you grab one for the model that you own, 
It'll explain in plain English what the different custom functions do, what the different options are, and some real life examples of why you might want to use them. It isn't just text taken strictly out of the owner's manual. But a couple of examples of why you may want to work with uh, some of the things you can do with the Rebel. One example is the so-called back button autofocus. Now this one, it, it always confuses people who haven't tried it. But there is a setting on the Rebel where you can basically change the way the camera works so that instead of focusing when you press the shutter button halfway down, you're still going to press the shutter button to take a picture. But instead of focusing when you press the shutter button halfway down, it focuses when you press the rear AE lock button with your thumb. You can also tailor it so that that rear AE lock button is a focus lock so that you focus, particularly with moving subjects in servo, so that you focus by pushing the shutter button halfway down. But now when you press that back AE lock button, you lock the focus instead of uh, the exposure. So there's a number of different things you can do in terms of you know t changing the function of different buttons to match the situation you're in and your own preferences. Another example is what can you do with the set button when you're shooting pictures? Now the set button, of course, is used in making menu settings and, and a variety of things like that. But that set button normally, by default, does nothing when you're shooting pictures. If I have the camera up at my eye and I'm taking pictures and I just bring it down for a second and press the set button, normally nothing's going to happen. You can make that button a shortcut to something that you may want to work with uh, and not have to go into the menu to find. For example, this is a big one for me. You can use it as a shortcut to flash exposure compensation. We talked about exposure compensation a little while ago, how you can lighten and darken a scene. Well, you have a separate command for flash exposure compensation, so that if, you got full, if you're taking a flash picture, you can lighten or darken the flash output. Normally, the Rebels make you go into the menu to get to that, which if you take a lot of flash pictures can be kind of a pain in the neck. So you can set up a shortcut where you just hit the set button and immediately the flash compensation comes up on the rear LCD monitor. Uh, can be very convenient. Another example is using the set button to immediately change whether you're shooting JPEGs or RAW images, the so-called image quality settings. You can have the camera instantly bring up that menu by just pressing the set button rather than having to stop what you're doing, press the menu button, make sure you're in the right menu tab, find that, and so on. Uh, so you can take what might have taken three or four steps and you know bring it down to one if you're the type of person that frequently changes from RAW to JPEG or something. Again, these are in your custom function menu, and we've explained in, in layman's terms what, how the custom functions work and what they do with the sheets that we have up here. So if you haven't grabbed one for your camera, uh, you can come up and do so after we're done speaking. One of the cool things that digital brings to us is the ability, when we're going from the stage of taking snapshots to that stage of taking photographs, the ability in the camera to really influence how our images look. And what we're talking about here is image control. We've already talked about exposure control and that kind of thing. And of course, that's extremely important. But we're going beyond that now into basically how do the images look? What can we do with them without going into Photoshop? How often do you hear people uh, talking about digital photography that say, well, you know, I didn't get the exposure quite right, or I didn't get the white balance quite right, or whatever, whatever but you know, what do they say? I'll fix it in Photoshop. And sure, you know, Photoshop and progr image editing programs like that are a tremendous, tremendous tool that we never had when we shot film images. But you don't want to use it as a crutch. The closer you can come to giving a program like Photoshop or an image editing program similar to it, the closer you can come to giving it an image that is right on at the beginning, number one, less time you're going to have to spend at the computer. I don't know about you, I like taking pictures more than I like spending at the computer. But beyond that, the less chance there is that you're going to have to do something destructive to get the image the way you want. Every time you start monkeying around with curves and that kind of thing in Photoshop, you're technically taking a little bit of information out of the picture. If you can avoid doing that, you got that much more to work with. You've got virtually the same control over the images in the Rebels that you do in our high-end cameras like a 7D or a 5D Mark II or for that matter even the 1D series. You've got control over things like the overall color, the way the camera is going to render detail, um, contrast control, control over the amount of digital noise in the picture, a variety of things that you can control right in the camera. 
Back in the days when we shot film, the amount of control you could do aside from lightening and darkening Im an image was pretty much, uh, pretty much related to taking a, taking a negative to a lab and saying, hey, make a, pr make a print of this and I want it to look exactly this way. And you paid a lot of money for the privilege. Nowadays, the camera's the processing lab. Your computer's the processing lab. But we're talking about things you can do in the camera itself. So many things you can do. First one is just making the fundamental choice. Do you want to shoot RAW or JPEG images? Let me ask the question here. How many folks here shoot RAW images most of the time? OK, yeah, about half of you. OK, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you that there's a right or a wrong answer here. You know, for those of you who either don't shoot raw images or just aren't familiar with what they're all about, uh, with a raw image, you have the ability, once you get to the computer, of course, to process that image into a fully recognizable file and change many, many different components of that image. You can completely change the white balance settings. You can completely change the, the contrast, the brightness, a whole bunch of other things without these changes being what I just said a moment ago, destructive. Uh, there are limits to what you can do, but you can still, within those limits, have a tremendous amount of control. And raw images, at least in theory, also give you slightly better image quality in terms of the tonal range that's captured and so on. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not a raw image snob. There's nothing wrong with shooting JPEG images. JPEG images mean that you take a picture, the camera processes that picture in the camera itself, and then writes that process file onto the memory card. You've got an image on the card that is good to go. It's got the same pixel resolution if you shot at full resolution. It's got the same pixel resolution as a raw image would. So it's not like a raw image has more detail inherently uh, in terms of you know pixel detail. And as long as you've got the settings right in the camera, you've got an image that in some cases is going to be virtually indistinguishable from a raw image taken by a professional. Uh, it's very convenient, and certainly for people that are just getting started with a digital camera, uh, usually we tell them, hey, shoot JPEG images and get comfortable with your camera. Learn about what your camera can do. You know, then you can move into raw images when you feel like the time is right. One of the things you hear photographers talk about is your white balance control. White balance is all about just simply getting the overall color in the scene correct. I'm sure from time to time, every one of you has seen a shot like this. You know, what's the, what's the problem? Color's not right. <laughs> Why? The white balance wasn't right. Seen inside a subway car in Moscow with fluorescent lights, automatic white balance tried to do its job, but you know, it got weirded out by What's that? What's there? Well, with the right, with the correct white balance setting, you can get it a lot closer to the way you want it to be. Automatic white balance does what it can to give you a pleasing result, but there are going to be times where you can step in and make it a little better. Here's a shot taken in an ultra wide angle shot taken late in the afternoon in a shaded area. If you're looking at this and thinking it looks a little blue, you're right. It is a little blue. It's a clear, sunny day. Late in the day, all that blue sky is coming down and giving us a bluish cast. Well, if we simply set the camera to the shade white balance setting, warms the picture right up, gives us a more pleasing result. But all that being said, the AWB, the automatic white balance setting, isn't a bad place to begin. No one's saying make your photography more work. There are going to be times where if you want to take your photography to the next level, you're going to need to make decisions and do something with your camera. It doesn't mean, though, that before you take every shot, you've got to spend 15 minutes going through the instruction book or making all kinds of changes and everything for every shot you take. That's silly. And I'm not one of these people who tells you that, oh, for every time you take a picture, you need to do a custom white balance or you need to do, you know, set the white balance for every shot. You don't. The automatic white balance generally works fine. It gives you a real good starting point most of the time. Can you mess it up sometimes? Sure. There are a lot of different types of light. And different types of light have different color, if you will. Auto white balance tries its best to deal with this, sort it out, and give you color that's going to look right. And most of the time, it does a pretty good job. But again, 
even looking at the monitor on the back of your camera, there are going to be times you take a picture like that shot in the subway where you just look at it and say, that just doesn't look quite right. And again, if it, you know, I've said it before, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, you know, guess what? It probably is. You know, if the color looks whacked out on the monitor, there's a good chance the camera didn't get it right. If you've got the opportunity to take the picture again, consider changing the white balance and going to something different. But again, I got nothing against auto white balance. It's a great place for your general shooting. The camera does give you other, what we call, preset choices. They're usually indicated by a, an icon, like the daylight would be a little sun icon, and the cloudy setting would be like a little set of clouds icon, and so on. One, speaking of these icons, one of them, uh, I do not understand how the industry, not just Canon, but the whole photo industry, settled on two triangles and a rounded, a rounded rectangle to indicate custom white balance, but that's what that means. Uh, so if you see that funny little icon there, custom white balance is what they're talking about. Here's a real life example. Again, auto white balance, in this case on an overcast kind of rainy day, can give you images that look a little bluish. If we set it to the cloudy white balance, or even the flash white balance, this isn't a flash picture, but if we set it to one or the other, it'll warm the colors up considerably. Give us a more pleasing result that actually looks closer to what our eyes saw. Shade is the same thing, only even stronger. The shade white balance setting really tries to warm the scene up. So you take a shot like this one that's obviously in shade, got a very bluish kind of result. Shade white balance neutralizes that and then some. Warms it up considerably. Yes? No. The gentleman's question was if you, if you change the white balance, and press preview, I presume. You mean the depth of field preview button? Is that what you meant? Or press the shutter button halfway, do you get a preview of what it's going to look like? The answer is no. You have to take a picture and then it'll you know, play it back on the LCD monitor. Uh, even if you're using the live view feature. Actually, if you're using live view, you will see it. But if you're not using live view, if you're just looking through the regular viewfinder, you're not going to see anything until the picture's taken and you see it played back on the monitor. If you were using the live view feature, if your camera offers that, then you would. Tungsten household lights. And again, for this, it's important to understand. We're not talking the compact, the compact fluorescent lights that you're seeing more and more of now used indoors, the lights that look like a little snow cone or whatever. Uh, we're talking here conventional tungsten household lights. Often, they, get a little, they look a little yellowish. But if you go to your tungsten white balance setting, that'll usually get that pretty darn close. Tungsten white balance is indicated by an icon that looks like a little light bulb. Now, what do you do in the case of those compact fluorescent lights? They can be just all over the ball yard in terms of white balance. So, you know, my recommendation is try auto at first and see what you get there. What some pros will do when they really need to get the color right is they'll take a custom white balance setting. I'm not going to get into that today, but it's an option that's available to you to literally take a picture of something white under those lights, tell the camera, hey, correct for this, and set a custom white balance. That's the, the process. But that's getting kind of involved. But hey, if it's a real important picture, maybe it's worth getting involved. One of the things you understand about white balance is we don't, just like exposure, we don't just do it to make the colors right. Most of the time we do. But there are times we do it for an effect. Setting sun, you know, very you know, vibrant, you know, yellow-orange uh, type of sky. What's auto white balance going to try to do? Well, it's, it's automatic white balance. It's trying to correct the color. If it sees an imbalance of color, if it sees a preponderance of one color or another, it's going to try to, to balance that out. And in doing so, it's going to strip out some of that warmth and stuff that you see. This is a case where you probably want the sky to look you know, nice and orange and so on. So in a case like this, shooting at the daylight setting, or even more so, moving into like the shade white balance, brings the color back not a shaded scene. We're not saying shade because these palm trees are silhouetted. What we're saying though is a shade white balance warms the color up. It gives us kind of a, an orangish look. And here, you know, it's a mismatch, but it's a good mismatch. 
Shot like this one was taken at about seven in the morning on a crummy, dank, rainy day. And this is just about what it looked like with auto white balance. Setting it to the tungsten white balance and just simply zooming in slightly as well. This is what it felt like. Is this what our naked eye saw? No, of course not. Personally, I like that picture better. Somebody got questions? Come again? Uh, some of them were done as raw files where we took a raw file and changed the white balance, like that shot of the uh, two ladies walking in front of the building on the rainy day. It was the same shot. You didn't see a move between shots. It was the same shot, but we changed the white balance to indicate what would have happened if we changed it in the camera. You can do that with a raw exposure. Now, white balance is really your first line of defense in terms of getting the overall color the way you want in your pictures. And you know, anybody that comes to me and says, you know, my digital camera, I don't like the color of it. The first thing I want to say is, well, you know, what's your control of your white balance like? You know, what's, you know, show me some examples. But it's not the only thing. It's just the first thing. There's a lot of things you can do besides the white balance with your color or di dictate whether you want color at all. And that's with a neat control in most of the Rebel cameras called your picture style. Once again, you need to be out of the green zone and out of the picture icon modes to be able to get to it. Now, for those of you shooting with an original Rebel or a Rebel XT, your camera does not have picture style. Your camera uses a simpler concept, same idea, but not quite as much in the way of options, called parameters. But any camera after the XT, XTI, XS, XSI, and so on, have the picture style controls. There are six different picture style settings. And when picture styles were first introduced, the way we described them to customers was, it's almost like if you think back in the film days where a professional photographer would often pick a certain type of film because he or she liked the way it rendered color for a certain type of subject. There were films that people used because they gave great skin tones, nice, smooth skin tones for portraits and stuff. There were other films that, had a, that gave you very rich, saturated color for your fall foliage pictures and that kind of thing. They weren't that kind of skin tones, but they had their other purposes. Picture style control lets you, in the camera, do the same kind of thing. This is entirely separate from the white balance we talked about. Let's assume for discussion's sake that you've got the white balance dialed in or the camera did it automatically and that that's under control. You like what the white balance is. And the cool thing about these six picture styles is that you can further go in and fine tune them for your preferences. The camera gives you six different starting points, which are kind of neat in and of themselves. And then you can go in and make some fine adjustments. Before we do that, though, we need to be sure we're talking on this, we're on the same page in terms of some of the terms we use, just so you have a picture in your mind about what we're talking about. One term you'll hear used when people talk about fine control of color is the term color saturation. And what we're talking about here is pretty simple. It's basically how rich and vibrant are the colors in the scene. We can have, a, have an image with relatively low color saturation. We can have an, an image with relatively high color saturation. Now, as Americans, we're taught from birth that more must be better. And, you know, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, whether it's bed, how many bedrooms are in our house, how much horsepower is in our car, or what color saturation setting our camera is set to. If it's high, if, you know, it must be better than low. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, no. High color saturation can be kind of cool if you've got a subject that doesn't have a lot of color in it, and you're trying to make it snap, crackle, and pop, so to speak. The flip side is high color, high color saturation is going to do some wacky things to skin tones. Uh, on a good day, it can make people very easily make people look like they're sunburned. On a bad day, you don't want to show them the picture. So don't just assume with color saturation that you always want to just boost it up to the top any more than you always want to drive down the road at 100 miles an hour, even if your car can go 100 miles an hour. There's a time and a place for everything. You know, driving down the street, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, going through a school zone is not the place to floor it. 
And you know, when we're taking pictures of people, high color saturation isn't really where we want to be, usually. Your control of contrast is another thing. Contrast can be a hard thing to define, but basically you can think of it in, in crude layman's terms as basically how light are the light things in the picture versus how dark are the dark things in the picture. A scene with high contrast, we'd expect to have the dark things be very dark and the light things be very light. And a scene with low contrast, we'd expect the light to be a lot more flat, a lot more grays and fewer pure whites, pure blacks. You take a scene like this, okay, artificially lit building at night, this is harsh contrasty lighting. The lighting is casting hard shadows, but the camera is set to give us a low contrast result deliberately. And what that means is that if you look at areas like where these spotlights at the bottom of the building are illuminating, and you look at some of the dark areas, we got some detail in these windows. Not a lot, but I mean, we got some detail in these windows. And there's more on the file than what we see on the screen here uh, with the projector. And the same thing here, we got detail here. Now, if we take that same scene shot at low contrast, look what happens if we take that same scene and do it as a high contrast shot. There's nothing in these windows now. And look here, I'll go back again so you can see the difference. Look at the difference in terms of the level of detail that you have in the light and the dark areas. That's what, contra that's what contrast control is all about. And one of the things of taking your pictures from the, rel from the realm of snapshots to the realm of photographs is understanding when you need to go in there and make an adjustment so that you have the detail you want or the look you want. In a case like this, this is on an overcast kind of dreary morning. It's flat lighting. A low contrast image is going to look very flat and bl kind of bland and blah. This is the kind of time where you want a brilliant high contrast image. It's going to snap in the picture up and give you a result that's going to, you know, have more in the way of, uh, you know, vibrancy to it. So high contrast in the camera is probably a good thing if you're outside on a, you know, a foggy day, a cloudy day, that kind of thing. Just go back to that for a second. You know, on the other hand, if you're outside on a bright, sunny day, you may want to tame the contrast down a little bit so that your shadows don't just go black like that. Uh, so that you have detail in your shadows and your highlights and so on. Sharpening is one of the most misunderstood things when people are talking about controls in the camera. After all, why wouldn't you want the sharpest possible picture? You know, most of us would think so. Uh, so why wouldn't you just set the sharpening in the camera always to the highest setting? Well, there's some reasons. Here's an example. It's a raw image, but we can change the way it's processed. Uh, and we've processed it multiple ways. If we look at just one small area of this, now again, you're losing some stuff with the LCD projector, so bear with me. And where you, if you don't see much of a difference, go by what I say more than what you see. You may see things a little bit more clearly on the monitors off on the side. If we apply no digital sharpening to this image, we get a result like this. Now again, you hear the word sharpening and you think, why wouldn't you just always have it set up to the max? You have to understand what happens when we sharpen an image digitally, either in the camera or, for that matter, in the computer, using a program like an Adobe Photoshop or whatever. In layman's terms, in very simple terms, what's happening when we sharpen an image electronically is the system is looking for areas where light pixels and dark pixels come together. And where it sees those areas, it makes the dark pixels darker and the light pixels lighter and gives you the illusion of more contrast between the two and when you view it from a little bit of a distance it appears like it's more sharp. But just like there's such a thing as putting too much sugar in your coffee or too much salt on your french fries, you can over sharpen an image and you can do it very easily. If we take the camera's controls and sharpen it to a level three, again you're probably not seeing much of a difference on the screen here but Rest assured, on the actual file, it's starting to give us crisper information in these kind of areas. The detail in the scene is being rendered more crisply. So, why wouldn't you just throttle it all the way down? Well, this is what happens when you do it all the way at level 7. There's a couple of problems. And again, you folks sitting in the back of the room may be looking at this and saying, oh, what's not to like? It looks great. The problem is when you start looking close, you can see, number one, there's a lot more noise in the picture. 
because what noise was present in the file has been exaggerated by the sharpening. You got a lot more of a salt and pepper effect going on in the sky and so on. The other thing you see, which is kind of undesirable when you look close, is that anywhere you got a bright highlight, there's a little dark band running along with it. They call that a halo. And you can see the same thing in reverse as well. If you shot a shot of like branches of a tree, which would be rendered dark, if you look close, you can see like a little white halo around the branches when you start over sharpening. So sharpening is one of those things, I'm not saying don't do it, just understand you don't want to necessarily go all the way. Another control we talk about is uh, color tone. And what we're talking about here is two different ways to warm the tones in your image. I'm not talking white balance now. We're past white balance. When you go into the picture style controls indiv individually, you'll see a, a thing for color tone, and you'll see it's based on numbers. And it's kind of counterintuitive. But basically what we're saying is how warm is the picture going to be by either adding magenta to it, kind of a pinkish tone, or by adding yellow to it, giving it a warm tone on the yellow side. Here's an example. In a neutral setting, this is the rendering we're getting. If we go all the way to the magenta setting, you can see the difference. I'll go back again so you can see it. Look at the difference in the color, the way the yellows and so on are recorded. That's normal. That's going all the way to the minus 4 setting. And that's going all the way to the plus 4 setting. Color tone really is for fine-tuning your skin tones. You shoot a lot of portraits and stuff, you may find that you want to kind of fine-tune them a little bit and either warm them up a little bit by going on the yellow side, which frankly I think you probably do more often, or maybe fine-tune them by going a little on the magenta side. It's real easy to go too far and have people start looking sunburned. So, you know, just be cautious. But that's what color tone is about. Now, I started off by saying that there were six different picture style options. Three of them are ones that you'll probably use most of the time. The camera comes out of the box in the so-called standard picture style. The standard picture style, we'll talk about it in more detail, but the standard picture style is designed to give you what it thinks is a snappy, brilliant, colorful rendition. Neutral and faithful are two other choices you have where the, the, the contrast and the color rendition, the color saturation are kind of backed off a bit. You also have a portrait and a landscape setting and then a monochrome setting, which is black and white. Now understand, if you shoot raw images, you can shoot with any of these picture styles, and if you don't like the way it looks, when you're processing that raw file, if you're using the Canon software, the digital photo professional software that comes with your camera, if you're using that to process it, you can completely overwrite it. So I can shoot a picture even as a monochrome image, and then get, get it back and look at it on the computer and say, eh, good idea, but black and white didn't work for there. I wish I'd recorded the color. Well, just process it as a color image with the standard picture style or the neutral or whatever, and bingo, you got a color image. If you shoot JPEG images, you don't have that liberty. If you shoot JPEG images, what you dial in here when you take the picture is what you're going to get. And any changes you make are going to be changes in Photoshop or something to add color, tone down the color, whatever it might be. And again, you don't want to be there. Picture style control is a great thing for JPEG shooters. It's a great thing to understand because you can really control and fine tune the look of your photographs. And if you do it right, you can get images that really, really are maximized in terms of the quality that they have and in terms of you know, just what they look like in terms of in, in getting the, the results you wanted when you press the shutter button. I started a moment ago saying that the standard picture style gives you a very vibrant image. It increases the color saturation. It increases the level of sharpening. Uh, it increases the contrast slightly. The idea is to give you an image that looks sharp, vibrant, and snappy. That'll look good when you look at it initially on the monitor. It'll print well on most inkjet printers most of the time. Sometimes it's a bit much. Bright sunny days, you can sometimes be right on that border of, hey, there's, there's already a lot of contrasty light here, and this kicking up the contrast is not the right answer. The standard picture style, or excuse me, the neutral picture style backs that off. I like the neutral picture style a lot. It gives you much of the time, in my opinion, a better starting point. Now, that's just my opinion. The next person may feel entirely differently, and that's fine. Yeah, sure. You, know, you look at the level of detail 
in the bright highlights on these flowers. And look at the, the level of color saturation here on standard and then compare it to what you get with neutral. There's more information in here on the neutral setting because there's less contrast. So again, personally, I like the neutral picture style uh, as a starting point, particularly when I'm shooting outdoors in sunlight. In situations like these, we showed you before, can make all the difference in the world. One of the things that you have to do is look at your scene, ask yourself, how is it lit? What's my subject? What do I want? What am I trying to say? You know, here's a shot taken on a very bright, sunny day, high contrast. Uh, do I want information in these shadows here, or do I not? Mo you know, the, 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 the textbook description of what to do here is, oh, well, it's contrasty lights. You'd, wanna, you'd probably want to shoot in the neutral picture style and lower the contrast and all that. You may not. You may want a very dramatic look with, you know, black shadows. There may be nothing in these shadows that you want. Standard would work great then. So you got to think about what are you shooting, what are the lighting conditions, what am I trying to say? Showed you how in flat lighting, yeah, that extra contrast of the standard picture style may be just what the doctor ordered to give you the results you're looking for. You run into this occasionally. It's rare, but it happens. Where you go to take a picture of something that has a distinct color. It could be like a, you know, a good example is like certain shades of violet and blue, either in fabric or in flowers or whatever, and it just doesn't come out right. Everything else looks fine, and you got this one color, and it's just like, wait a minute, that was a blue flower, not purple, or vice versa, or something. If you're running into that, that's an instance where you may want to try the faithful picture style. I'm not saying the faithful picture style is a magic wand. Frankly, I don't like it personally for ordinary, everyday shooting. But if you're having problems getting a certain color to reproduce properly, try the faithful picture style. And this is one reason why shooting raw images can be such a benefit, because even if you didn't try the, picture, the faithful picture style when you shot the picture, if you get it back at the computer and you say, yeah, wait a minute, I don't like the way the color looks here. Let me, you know, you got options. Whereas with a JPEG image, what you shoot is what you get. You ever wonder how they get those uh, postcard pictures with the, you know, really saturated deep blue skies and everything? You know, you know one, reason, one way you can do it with this camera is to shoot in the landscape mode. If you shoot in landscape, it kicks the saturation up even further, especially on your blues and your greens. It kicks the contrast up and it kicks the sharpening up. The aim is to give you a very deeply, richly saturated image. Don't use it with pictures of people. It does some, it does some crazy things to skin tones, and it is not real kind to red tones either. Reds and oranges and stuff start getting a little funky on the landscape picture style. But if you take a, as the name says, if you take a typical landscape picture uh, and you want that real postcard kind of look, it can give it to you. So all this is control you have in the camera where you don't have to go into Photoshop, know what you're doing, and try to change the color for there. Got a question? You could still use the landscape picture style and try it and see if it gave you the result you wanted. If, there were, if there's a lot of blues and greens in the scene, it behaves pretty predictably. If the scene is like a shot of a red Corvette or something, you can try it, but it may do some funny things to the red Corvette. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Say again, I'm sorry. Young lady's question was, if there were people in a landscape picture like this, would I have any qualms about still using the landscape picture style setting? Uh, the answer would be basically how, how much of the picture are the people dominating? If they're just, you know, two little folks, you know, down along here, kind of there for effect, no problem. On the other hand, if I've got two people close to the camera and it's clear, I'm trying to take a portrait but place them, you know, with a nice landscape behind them, but they're taking up half the picture. Uh, I probably would go to standard or neutral or something like that. Um, you know, you could try it. 
just understand that again, landscape isn't the right choice when you're doing skin tones where they're a priority in the picture. Yes, I'm sorry. That's a good question. The gentleman's question was, with raw file processing, if you use the camera manufacturer's software, the Canon DPP software, digital photo professional software that comes with your camera to process raw Canon files, uh, you obviously have software that matches the intent of the engineers and it matches your camera settings. So I said, as I said, with the picture styles, you can shoot an image in one picture style, and if you shot a raw picture and you didn't like it, if I shot this in the landscape mode and I said, eh, I don't want that brilliant blue sky, I want it to flatten a little bit, I could process it with the neutral picture style and totally change it. So the gentleman's question was, what if you use a third party raw file processing software, not the camera maker software, but something like Adobe's Lightroom, Apple's Aperture, uh, there are various other third party raw file processing programs that some folks like to use. They got some neat controls and some neat capability. In most cases, the picture style settings are ignored. No matter what you set in the camera, they just march to their own drummer and process the image the way they feel it ought to be processed. Now, Adobe in particular, lately, over the last year, has brought out versions of their raw file software that try to emulate the Canon picture styles. And when you give it a raw Canon file, it'll say, you know, portrait picture style or landscape or whatever. They're kind of reverse engineering it to try to give results that are as close as they can to what the Canon software has given you. So if, it, if you have software that recognizes those tags and it gives you the choice of changing picture styles, hey, go ahead and try it. Knock yourself out and see what, you, see what you have. Just understand that in many cases, in most cases, it's an emulation. Uh, if you want the real deal, you got to use the Canon software or the camera maker software. Oops, I'm sorry. As I said, I like the neutral picture style. I like what it does. It, it, it doesn't play up any particular color. It's nice for skin tones. Uh, and you can sort of season it to taste as well. And there's even the monochrome setting, the black and white, where you can take a setting and you can take a shot and literally render it as a black and white image. And that can be a fun exercise sometimes, uh, even if you don't shoot raw files, even if you just, you're a JPEG shooter. Someday, go out and just spend a morning shooting pictures black and white and just sort of teach your eye to see the form and you know, shape and texture of things and work with black and white a little bit. It can be a fun exercise. Now, the engineers didn't stop there. You got the six picture styles in the camera and you can go into each of those picture styles if you want to on the menu of the camera and you can further adjust the level of sharpening, the level of color saturation, the color tone, uh, and um, God, why am I forgetting the one other thing? The point being, you can go in there, though, and you can, for instance, the neutral setting, you may want to go in there and refine certain things of it. You may want to give it a little more contrast. That was the other thing I was ignoring. You may want to give it a little more color saturation. You can do that. There's four scales in the menu on your camera uh, where you can go into the so-called detail settings of each picture style and fine-tune it a little bit. So understand, you have that color control as well. Like I said, the camera has turned into almost like a little processing lab. So if you don't like my recommendation in the beginning, just you know, leave the camera on standard or neutral and just go out and shoot pictures and just sort of see what you like. But over time, you're going to start seeing, ah, eh, there's times that I don't like this particular effect or that particular effect. Then that's the time to go in and start tinkering with the controls that are available to you. Now, as I started to say, the engineers didn't stop with just the six picture styles in the camera. Online, on our Canon website, there are actually seven additional choices that you can download and either install into your camera and call them up whenever you want, or that you can put in your computer. And if you process raw files using the Canon software, you can apply them that way. There's three spaces, blank spaces, called user set one, two, and three, where you can put these downloadable picture styles if you want to. Yes, you got a question? It's funny you mention that, because I'm going to get to it in a minute. So hold off, because I didn't completely leave that. Um, but the downloadable ones, 
uh, are kind of neat as well. Or as I said, you can install them in the computer. So you got a choice of putting them in the, com in the camera or putting them in the computer. Now, to the young lady's question. One example is the portrait picture style. You got a portrait picture style in the camera. This is another one, speaking personally, I'm not crazy about. It's a little contrasty and it warms the picture up by putting in a lot of magenta. So it's real easy for skin tones to start looking sunburned. I much prefer neutral most of the time, but the engineers came up with a different flavor on it, the so-called snapshot portrait that you can download. Snapshot portrait gives a much nicer skin tone in my opinion. So if you shoot a lot of portraits and you try the portrait picture style and you just don't like what it does, you may want to try downloading the snapshot portrait mode, uh, picture style and see what the effects are with that. <laughs> you said it first. <laughs> Not for the XT because it doesn't have picture style control. So you got, your camera has to be able to do picture styles. You can do it if you shoot raw images. You can download this, these picture styles, put them in your computer, and then if you process with DPP, even if you shot them with an early Rebel camera that didn't have picture styles, you can apply the picture styles after the fact when you process your raw files. But you can't do it in the camera when you shoot them. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank her. <laughs> this is another one that can be kind of fun. Uh, here's a a, a scene taken at dusk in the neutral picture style, pretty predictable, nothing special, is a twilight picture style. These your results look kind of like that. I'll go back again so you can see the difference. That's neutral. That's twilight. That can be a fun one to play with. Not one you're going to use all the time. What it does is it basically gives you kind of a violet tinge to bluish skies and that kind of thing without really affecting the rest of the picture. So the twilight setting can be kind of a fun one to play around with too. For those of you who are interested, this is the site where you can download them. I'll give you a moment to write that down if you want. It's a free download. Yes. No, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, the B&H folks can tell you what the pricing is. Um, I'm not here to try to sell you on the cameras per se. Um, I mean, I can give you a ballpark idea of what they go for, but if you got a particular model in mind, the best thing when we're done talking be to see one of the folks at the counter and check with them on what the pricing of the model you're interested in would be. Everybody get that that wanted to? Okay, I'll give you a second. How's that? Everybody? You have a question? <laughs> Young lady's question was, if you were really an expert in Photoshop, could you essentially do the same things in a program like Photoshop? The answer is yeah. The problem with it is twofold. Number one, it can be kind of time consuming, especially if you're doing it on an individual basis. The other thing is, beyond that, once you get an image into Photoshop and you start tinkering around with color and tones and stuff like that, in theory anyway, every time you do that, you're tossing out a little bit of information. And you don't want to do that too much. I'm not saying you should never do that or that it's wrong to do those kind of adjustments in Photoshop. If you know what you're doing, you can get certain results that the picture styles can't get you, obviously, in Photoshop or, again, a similar image editing program. Um, but Again, I stand by what I said earlier. One of the goals that I think is a good one to keep in mind is to try to give Photoshop the best possible starting point you can. The less you have to do in a program like Photoshop, I don't care if you're you know, Thomas Knoll who invented Photoshop, the less you have to do in Photoshop with an image, usually, all else being equal, the better off the image is going to be uh, in terms of you know, how much tonal range does it have and that kind of thing. So. But the short answer to your question, can you do a lot of the stuff in Photoshop? Sure. Camera gives you a few other interesting technologies to be aware of that can really make your pictures better. Uh, one of them on the newer cameras is a technology called Auto Lighting Optimizer. This is something you could turn on or you can turn off. 
Auto Lighting Optimizer does two things. First thing it does is when you have a scene that's in relatively flat light, doesn't have a lot of contrast, this is an example of it with the Auto Lighting Optimizer off, it'll go in and boost the contrast a little bit for you. Don't expect that you'll see a night and day difference. It won't. But the idea is, especially for folks that shoot JPEGs, it once again goes behind the scenes and tries to give you a better starting point. One less thing you'd have to do to tweak in Photoshop, all else being equal. The other thing, well, before I leave that, the auto lighting optimizer, on some of the cameras when it was first introduced, you had a choice of on or off. The newer cameras, like the Rebel T1i and so on, they give you a choice of standard, low, strong, or off. So you can kind of tailor it the way you want. Out of the box, the system comes at standard. Some photographers who you know, do all their processing themselves and who are extremely critical about their exposures and the control may prefer, they may, they may not want the camera to be making judgments about contrast on its own. So they may prefer to turn it off. Usually the standard setting is fine if you have one of the newer Rebel cameras. And again, usually the auto lighting optimizer is a good thing. The other thing that the auto lighting optimizer does is it literally evaluates the picture you take after it's taken. So in other words, you got your metering system that reads the light and all that stuff. We talked about that earlier. You go ahead and take the picture. The instant you take the picture, the auto lighting optimizer looks at the brightness range of it and if it senses that you have underexposure in part of the scene, it'll go in and try to lighten it a little bit. So here's an example with the auto lighting optimizer off. Here's the same image. You look at the shadow areas there on the young lady's face. Here's the same image on. It's not a night and day difference. It's not like going into Photoshop and making a huge adjustment. But the point is, it's giving you a little better starting point. What it thinks is a little better starting point. Now again, the real critical user who's doing studio lighting and you know doing their own lighting ratios and stuff, they may not want this. They may not want the camera. They, they may feel like, look, I set up a certain lighting ratio. I don't want the camera coming in and changing it, even tweaking it a little bit. So if that's the case, just turn it off. Any questions? Again, this is something that, that is not acceptable. Right. The question was, if you shoot a RAW file, does this affect it in any way? You can fully adjust it in, in the digital photo professional software, but other software programs aren't going to see the tags and aren't going to do anything with it. That's one important thing to remember about a raw image. All these different camera settings, the picture styles, this type of stuff, and so on. What happens when you shoot a raw image is the image is tagged with all this information, but it doesn't actually affect that raw picture data until you go and process the image. If you process it using Canon software, what happens is those tags are looked at, and unless you change something in the computer, the, the system says, OK, the user wants to process this image. Here's what it was. Here are the tags that were in effect when the picture was taken. Let's just go ahead and use those. And like I said, you can completely overwrite those for white balance, for picture style. In this case, for auto lighting optimizer, you can completely change them if you want. But if you don't, the tags are red. A lot of third party software is real weak on reading those tags that the camera left. It's weak on reading those road signs the camera left behind. And if that's the case, it just ignores them. So this auto lighting optimizer is a good example. If you process a raw image using somebody else's software, it's probably not going to see them. And you just, again, you use whatever that software's controls are for contrast and so on. I mentioned before how important it is when you're shooting digital images not to overexpose important bright areas. You want white stuff to look white. You may need to lighten the exposure to get it to look white, but you don't want to overdo it. Because if you do, you probably are going to lose the information, and if you lose it, you are not getting it back in Photoshop. There's a neat technology called Highlight Tone Priority. And it's a custom function on the newer Rebel models. Not all the Rebels have it, but the newer ones do. And what it lets you do is it'll add up to an additional stop of detail in the bright areas and it does it without affecting the midtones and the shadows. Anybody can bring more, high, more detail into a white area by just darkening the whole picture. But that's not what the Highlight Tone Priority does. What the Highlight Tone Priority does is go in and literally buys you additional detail without 
darkening the rest of the scene. Here's an example. The highlights on priority off. We deliberately expose this in the manual mode so that the snow is just on the verge of blowing out. We turn it on, you got texture. There's more information in the file than what you're seeing on the LCD projector. Highlight tone priority is a cool technology. Uh, I like using it. The only downsides to using highlight tone priority are that if you do apply it, it's a custom function you need to turn on in your camera. If you do turn it on, what will happen is you lose the ability to shoot at ISO 100. Your lowest ISO available becomes 200. And on some of the cameras, you won't be able to go to the very, very highest ISO, like 3200 or on the newest one, 6400. That's curtailed as well. So the ISO range you can shoot at isn't as wide as it otherwise would be. But if you can live with that, Highlight Tone Priority is a neat technology. I love using it on bright, sunny days because it can, it can save your bacon in situations where you almost got the exposure right, but not quite. It's not a magic wand. There's, you know, there's a finite limit as to what it can do. But used within its limit, it's a great great piece of technology. Yep, in this case in the custom function menu. Yep. As I said, you, the only hit you take really with highlight tone priority is that your ISO range is curtailed. One other thing that you run into with digital cameras is when you start working at the higher ISOs in particular is digital noise. Like grain on film or like snow on a TV set so to speak. And in this case, we deliberately exaggerated it in Photoshop uh, to show you the effect. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about noise. Usually, it's not quite this bad. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that on the projector here, you could see what we're talking about. Really, when we're talking about noise, there are actually two types of noise we typically are talking about when, we, when we're shooting at the high ISO settings. One is called chrominance noise. And chrominance noise is, if you look real close, it's that kind of pastel colored, you know, bluish and magenta, you know, little speckles that are different colors that you start to see in a smooth area of skin tone. Or it doesn't have to be skin tone, just a smooth area of tone, period. It could be the side of a building or anything else. The other is what we call luminance noise. And luminance noise is a little different. Luminance noise is that kind of black and gray salt and pepper noise that we also see in smoothly toned areas of a scene. Now at low ISO settings, we don't normally see this at all. But if we shoot pictures at the higher ISOs, you know, 1600, 3200, that kind of thing, we begin to see this. It's true that the newer cameras give you tremendous image quality at high ISOs. And this new Rebel T2i that is just on the verge of being introduced uh, is very similar to the EOS 7D in that regard, though. It's very good at high ISOs. But even with that, you know, certainly if you shoot a picture at ISOs like 3200 or 6400, and if you look close, you're going to see some noise. Anyway, that being said, most of the cameras give you what we call a high ISO noise reduction. And the idea of this is that it minimizes both. Some of the cameras only gave you a choice of on or off for this high ISO noise reduction. The newer ones are more sophisticated, and they give you a choice of, again, low, standard, or strong, or you can turn it off altogether. One of the reasons that we give you the choice on the newer cameras, like the Rebel T1i, for instance, is you can go in and eliminate almost all of the chrominance noise and still have an image that looks pretty good. And under a worst case scenario, you may change the color tint of the image a little bit, but the image will still look good. The catch is, if you go in and completely strip out the luminance noise, that is the black and white speckled, the salt and pepper look, that also is where the detail in the image is. So your camera also has a separate long exposure noise reduction function in your custom functions that you can turn on or turn off. This one I generally recommend you leave on. It's a good idea normally. I'm going to back up for a second, sorry. The reason I say that is, first off, it's ignored if you shoot an image at a shutter speed faster than one second. It only kicks in if you shoot an image one second or longer on the shutter speeds. And what it does is it basically, when you take that picture, as soon as you're done taking the picture, in effect, it takes a second blank picture. You don't hear the shutter open and close. 
but what you'll see is that the, the card busy light on the back of the camera seems to be blinking on and off for quite a while. The camera is basically re-energizing the imaging sensor for the same length of time to generate the same level of noise, and then it compares it to what you just shot in the real picture. And what it sees that is identical, it strips out of the picture. So it's actually very effective when you're shooting time exposures and so on like this. The only catch is that if you use it, there is going to be that time after you take a picture that you can't take another one until it's over. If it's just a 15 second exposure like this, it may not be that big a deal. You know, a three hour shot of star trails on a perfectly dark night, it'll tie it up for another three hours building up the noise and, and figuring it up, out that way. But it will give you better results on those long exposures. That, that much is for sure. As we wind down, give you a few ideas for some things you can do for some typical situations that you know you may find yourself in when you're shooting with the Rebel cameras. And after we're done, you, we can certainly you know I can answer any questions that you have. You can come up and look at the cameras, uh, you know, try the different lenses on them, and so on. And we can you know certainly talk more. One thing that many of us take pictures of is people. And if you're shooting posed portraits, there's a lot of things you can do in terms of the way you work in the camera. Some of it is basic photographic technique. Others are more specialized things that are within the camera itself. You know, one, this is a basic photography thing, shoot verticals. Don't hesitate to shoot vertical pictures when you got people shots. People are lined up, up and down. Fill the frame effectively. You know, again, on the basis, on the, in the sense of general photography, unless there's a reason not to, use your wide lens openings. Throw those backgrounds out of focus. You know, if you have a reason not to, if you want to get the background nice and sharp and blend that into the scene, that's one thing. But, you know, in a shot like this, there isn't a heck of a lot to be said in the background. Focus on the subject. In terms of your metering, don't be fooled by the clothes the subject is wearing. You know, get the exposure so the skin tones are right. Real light colored clothing, real dark colored clothing can sometimes throw your metering off a little bit. If it doesn't look quite right, Use your exposure compensation, take another shot. Another thing you can do is use your spot metering or your partial metering and ignore that bright sequin dress or whatever it might be and just you know, meter right off the face. You still may need to compensate a little bit when you do that, up or down, you know, to get the exposures right. But it, by using the spot or the partial metering, you can bypass problem type subjects if, they, if that's what the subject is. In terms of the autofocus, you know, again, unless there's a reason not to, Put the focus right on the subject's eyes. Don't hesitate to be the boss and tell the camera what you want it to do. And you know, when we start, talk about the fine points of the way the image looks, you know, consider using the neutral picture style or perhaps that style you can download the portrait snapshot style uh, because that will give you nice skin tones. I'm not saying you can't shoot it on standard. But just understand that standard sometimes gives you that added contrast, which sometimes it works, and sometimes it can be just a little bit too much. Another one that, especially with the newer cameras, we find people doing more and more of, because the newer cameras can work at the high ISO settings and get such excellent results, is shooting indoors without flash in low light conditions. You know, be sure, even when you're, when you're in low light, even at the higher ISOs, be sure you're working at a fast enough shutter speed. You know, if you, be aware of what the shutter speeds are. We didn't get into that kind of basic stuff today, but it's important. You know, if you're trying to shoot this picture handheld at a 15th of a second, you're going to get some soft frames most of the time. And don't be chicken in terms of using the high ISOs. You'll hear some photographers say, oh, well, you know, you can't go above ISO 400 because you get noise. You know? Don't be afraid of experimenting. Know what your camera can do. You know, even if they aren't, you know, once in a lifetime pictures, don't wait to experiment when you're at, you know, your. You, you, know, you know, when you're at your brother or your sister's wedding and you're expected to come up with some good pictures. You know, experiment when you're just sitting around the living room at night watching reruns on TV. Uh, you know, take a shot at 400 ISO, at 800, at 1600, if your camera does it, even higher. And compare the results. Know what the camera can do. You know, again, focus carefully. Put the focus right on the eyes. Shot like this one, I gave this presentation once before and another group, and somebody said, well, how can you get both subjects in focus? We obviously have somebody in the foreground, somebody in the background who's out of focus. The bottom line is, in an available light picture without flash, you're probably not going to get both of them in focus unless you back way, way, way away from them and lose the whole sense of a portrait. If, I, if this was a full-length picture, if I backed up another 15 feet and shot these two people here full-length, yeah, I, I probably could get both of them pretty close to being in focus. But 
in available light like this, this is a dimly lit scene, uh, you're shooting with a lens wide open. There's not going to be a lot of that depth of field anyway, that zone of sharpness from foreground to background. You often in situations like this have to make a decision. You got to just, you know, I'll use the phrase again in a different context. Something in the picture has to be boss. You got to just decide, I'm going to focus on one thing or the other thing, put the focus there and let the rest of it fall where it may. Sometimes, you know, if this was outside in sunlight, I could stop the lens aperture way down and probably get pretty good sharpness foreground to background, but you're not always going to have that luxury. And in terms of the fine points, the color, the white balance, you know, don't hesitate if the, you know, do you take a shot on the auto white balance and it just doesn't look quite right. Think of that shot I showed you early in this presentation on the Moscow subway. If it doesn't look quite right, don't hesitate to take the picture again and try a different white balance setting. Shooting landscapes, scenic pictures and that kind of thing. Here's a case, you know, once again, starting with the, the photographic basics, here's a case where usually you want lots of things sharp foreground to background. So that means use your small lens openings, F11, F16, that kind of thing. Especially if you're shooting wide angle, it can be so important to have something in the foreground of the picture. You don't always have that opportunity, but if you do, if you can put something in the foreground of the picture, it'll usually add dramatically to the finished image. A lot of times you're shooting stuff with sky in the frame. Be careful. Doesn't mean don't take the picture. Just be aware that when there's sky in the picture, the camera meter is often going to try to knock the exposure down, darken the whole scene to control that sky. Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes no. So again, you know, look at your pictures that you get back. We're not going to get in today to, you know, reading histograms and that kind of thing, but look at your pictures on the monitor when you take it. And if it doesn't look quite right, go to that exposure compensation. Even here, where you're expecting a lot of things to be in sharp focus, pick one thing and focus on that and let everything else kind of fall where it may. You know, with, with your so-called depth of field and all that, you're probably going to get a lot of things in good sharp focus anyway if you're shooting at a distance and shooting a wide, with a wide angle lens. But still, focus deliberately on something that's important or focus about a third of the way into the scene. And even though we kind of got away with it here, certainly just in terms of basic composition, usually you don't want a horizon line right in the dead center of the picture. You know, something made you want to take that picture. Something in the landscape in the foreground, or perhaps it was something in the sky. Maybe there's a dramatic, you know, sunset or cloud formation or something. Something made you want to take that picture. Make that something take up more than half the picture area. Shooting close-up pictures can, of small objects can be an awful lot of fun. And even if you're not, you know, a biologist or, you know, somebody that's, you know, into flowers and that kind of thing by nature, you may find that once you get a close-up accessory, like an extension tube or a close-up lens to put onto your camera lens, or, you know, certainly if you were to invest in a true macro lens that can do real close-up shots, it, it opens up a new world. It's amazing what you can see in the most ordinary of things when you start getting close. Uh, there are definitely some things you can do when you take close-up pictures, regardless of what it's of, to improve your odds. One is, once again, you want to use small lens apertures. It's going to give you better sharpness. You're never in close-ups going to get everything sharp foreground to background unless it's all on pretty much the same plane. But you can get images that have more controlled sharpness if you shoot at those small lens openings anytime the light allows. This is one area where autofocus, as good as autofocus is on our modern cameras, autofocus doesn't always work great when we're shooting close-ups. Try it, but if it doesn't work, one of the most effective ways to shoot close-up pictures of small objects, if you're finding, particularly if you're finding the autofocus is getting a little skittish, if you're working with a zoom lens, zoom your lens to its maximum telephoto setting, whatever it happens to be. Switch off your autofocus. Put the lens on manual focus. You got a little switch on the, on the lens, AF and MF. Put it on MF. Now, turn the focus ring to its minimum focusing distance. And then, don't touch anything else. Okay, further turning of this ring is not going to make the lens focus any closer. Now, just go down to whatever your subject is and just keep on going until you see it come into sharp focus and then at that point take the picture. 
No messing around. You will often find by manually focusing, locking, not locking, but just setting the focus to the minimum distance, and then just moving yourself back and forth until you see the proper plane of focus come into focus, and then take the shot. You'll find oftentimes you can shoot quicker and more effectively than if you use the autofocus in, in these kind of scenarios. And part of it is you've got to pick one thing in the scene and decide you're going to focus on that. As I said, you never, I don't care if you use that manual focus technique or if you use an autofocus. In a shot like this one, you're never going to get everything to be in sharp focus. It's a physical impossibility most of the time in one single photograph. So pick one thing that you want to really stand out, put the sharpest focus there. And using your aperture priority, your manual exposure mode often gives you great results. Here's the kind of case also where having that control over your color can really make a difference. If you're trying to not just simply document something quickly, but if you really want something to look a certain way, going into your picture styles, thinking about the result you want, and going into your picture styles and either deliberately using the, the, the neutral or the faithful setting to, to kind of tone things down or to you know really spice things up, you know, put it on neutral or even try the landscape setting. I, like I said, it doesn't work that great with reds, but with blues and, and greens and stuff, uh, it'll you know, it'll jazz things up a bit for sure. So, you know, you can get the results you want. And, whoops, you will definitely need to think about using exposure compensation uh, in some cases. If you're shooting a close-up of a white flower, a light-colored flower, you know, expect that you may need to lighten the picture. And conversely, if you're shooting something that's dark-colored, you may need to darken it a little bit. Uh, the need for adjusting exposure doesn't change just because you're shooting close-ups. Shooting sports. Action pictures, and not, you don't have to be shooting professionally here. You can be just shooting, it can be something as mundane as, you know, your family coming over for a 4th of July picnic and people are, you know, throwing a baseball or a football around the backyard and you want to take some shots. It can be that you have, you know, kids that are playing, you know, Little League or, you know, youth soccer or something like that. You know, or it could be that you have, you know, you have access to shooting, you know, college sports or whatever it might be. This is yet another area where shooting vertical pictures makes a lot of sense. When you're trying to shoot, you know, one or two athletes in a frame, you fill the frame effectively by filling it vertically. I'm not saying don't ever shoot horizontals, just understand, you know, we say this a lot of times at our seminars. You're not going to break the camera by turning it sideways. Um, and there are certain kinds of scenes that when you're trying to compose them, and composition is as important in sports as it is in any other kind of photography, there are certain kinds of scenes where it just makes sense to start by composing the picture initially the way that it's going to best capture the subject. Subjects are laid out up and down. Sometimes that's the best way to shoot them. You need the fast shutter speeds. The Rebel camera can do some magical things. It can't counter the effect of using slow shutter speeds with a moving subject. We get this question a lot, too. A lot of the lenses now have the image stabilization that lets you, you know, that steadies the image at slower shutter speeds. What it steadies is the shake that you might deliver, you know, at your hand. It can't deal with subject movement. So if you still, if you need a 500th or a thousandth of a second to freeze that athlete without image stabilization, in terms of the athlete's movement, you're still going to need a thousandth or a 500th of a second to freeze it with image stabilization. Image stabilization, again, corrects handshake. It doesn't deal with subject movement. In terms of focusing, just put the camera in servo. End of story. AI servo is going to be the way to go. And I mentioned before, you've got the choice when you're focusing on that subject to have all the focusing points active, the automatic point selection, or to manually pick a single focusing point. The camera will almost always focus faster if you manually pick a single focusing point. So it, it, it may not matter much if the subject isn't moving very fast. But if you've got subjects that are moving, you know, like these are, you know, high school kids moving at, you know, pretty much adult speeds. Uh, you'll get better results manually picking a single focusing point, whether it's the center or whether it's one of the upper ones that would be looking at the face or whatever. You'll get usually get better results then. And it's important that whatever focusing point you choose, that it sees detail. Think about this. If you're shooting with a center focusing point, a lot of pro photographers like to do this. They use the center focusing point. If you've got a subject that is wearing very a very plain kind of uniform, uh, in terms of what you see on the front and what you see, you know, on the on the pants, if it's a plain uniform without much detail, without much texture, without numbers and that kind of thing, the focusing system is going to sometimes have a hard time seeing what to focus on. That's a situation where you may want to pick one of the points that isn't in the center, like one of the points up near the face, and focus there because you got the point looking at something with detail. It's a real important thing, and it's hard to do 
Easier said than done when you got a subject that's zigging and zagging and moving around quickly. But it's important that those little boxes see detail. It's as important here as it would be if you were taking a, picture, a portrait or a landscape picture. And don't, and once again, don't hesitate to use your exposure compensation. Sometimes you know you're going to need it when you shoot things like ice hockey with the white ice and stuff. Other times, you know, you may think you don't need it. But again, periodically, look at the back of the camera, see what the camera's delivering. If the images look too light or too dark, don't hesitate to change the exposure a little bit with your exposure compensation. The camera gives you, as, I, as we said, and this is, you know, we'll wind up here. The camera gives you, again, a ton of control. You know, much of it can be accessed either through the buttons or right in the menu of the camera. There's, no one is saying that you got to use every command in the camera all the time. There are going to be features in the camera, some of which we talked about today, that you may never touch, and that's okay. You know, those of you that have heard me speak before may have heard me use this analogy, but it applies to things like this. I said, don't make your photography complicated, but understand what you talk, understand what your options are. You know, if you think about it, this. The options in here are almost like if you think about the number of channels that a person can have if they have one of those deluxe cable TV packages nowadays where you could have hundreds of different channels that you can watch at any time. And you, whether you have a system like that yourself or whether you know somebody that does, I guarantee you nobody watches every single channel. There's going to be, you know, you probably have, you know, four or five or six at most that you watch 95% of the time. And I guarantee you there are dozens that you never touch. There are going to be features in the camera, likewise, that you know may sound interesting, but you just say, I don't really see a need for that. That's fine. And there are other ones that you look at, you think about the photography you do, you think about the situations you're in, you think, geez, you know, that could be kind of handy. So understand what the camera's capabilities are, understand what it can do, and experiment with it. That's maybe the last thing and the best thing I can tell you is shoot lots of pictures and experiment. Try different things. And you know, you, you're not going to break anything by trying different combinations. And the worst thing that can happen is you take a picture you don't like. You know, if it's not a once in a lifetime experience that you're trying to capture, no harm done. So that's our presentation for today. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you folks may have. Thank you very much. Thank you.